Welcome to our 2013 Spring Landscaping Workshop. My name is Jim Vaughn. I'm the Environmental Coordinator for the City of St. Louis Park. I have been uh, with the city for over 25 years in, in varying capacities, including uh, forester, park uh, supervisor, and um, my latest environmental coordinator. Uh, just to give you some ideas and some of my uh, background and some of the hobbies, just to, to let you know what I'm about a little bit. So we're going to talk about a number of different things today, including uh, sustainable landscape and lawns, butterfly gardens, invasive pests, uh, trees, tree care, tree planting, uh, and then uh, other organic uh, type matters uh, that uh, hopefully will cover some of those things you're interested in. Uh, first off, why do you want to plant trees and shrubs? You know, they're really a good uh, thing for a number of reasons. They're traffic calming, public safety. They've done a lot of the studies and all these things are uh, proven through uh, white papers and various uh, research articles. So uh, trees and landscaping are uh, uh, they obviously increase our property values, especially now our property values uh, could use all the help they can. So uh, plant a lot of trees, a lot of greening certainly will uh, heighten your uh, value of your, your home or your property. They absorb a lot of storm water. We're working with a lot of public works folks now with our engineering and uh, storm, instead of storm water ponds, they're planting f trees and flowers. Uh, you've heard rain gardens. I'm going to touch on those a little bit. They're doing um, um, all kinds of uh, what's called best management, excuse me, best management practices relating to stormwater. Uh, trees, for, for example, a mature elm tree in the middle of the summer on a sunny day will absorb uh, approximately 150 gallons of water in one single day. So trees are really beneficial uh, for uh, stormwater interception and also just for the uh, ecosystem of our uh, community. Other reasons for planting trees and shrubs and uh, flowers in general, of course, the air quality, the needles and the leaves are always filtering out those particulates that we can't see. Um, health and the quality of life, they re they've done a lot of studies on this. If you plant a lot of trees and around uh, areas uh, with high crime, it does dramatically reduce the amount of crime and uh, increase safety. And then uh, obviously energy, if you plant a, um, evergreen on the northwest corner of your house, for example, that will save uh, you have tons of energy from that northwest wind that's blowing really cold as it is today, uh, the day before spring in 2013, believe it or not. Or if you plant a, tree, a shade tree over your air conditioner or uh, in the right spot of your house, southwest corner, for example, of your house, it'll produce a lot more shade and reduce the air conditioning costs and uh, reducing uh, your energy bills. Uh, the wildlife habitat and then uh, um, uh, a lot of other things as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit more in the organic aspect of things and I'll start with lawn care and, and organic lawn care. I haven't treated my yard since I've been in my house over 22 years. Uh, I do get some dandelions but uh, it seems to be okay. They only last typically about three weeks so I'm just a, I'm a little bit more aggressively mowing them during that time and uh, my neighbors still will talk to me, believe it or not. So. Um, I don't fertilize, I just uh, will reuse my uh, clippings back into the, the grass and we'll aerate periodically and I'm going to touch on that a little bit. But I want to touch on some co components of or organic uh, gardening and uh, excuse me, organic lawn care first. We'll get into organic gardening. So there are a couple things you could do. You, first, if you want to fertilize or not, like I said, I don't fertilize and there are other ways you can uh, certainly fertilize uh, using the synthetic, synthetic fertilizers. Uh, there's also um, a corn gluten meal that has been uh, studied at Iowa State University and it's a corn byproduct and it's really good. Uh, uh, they've proven after a couple years of application uh, it's a good uh, fertilizer as well as a pesticide. So uh, corn, corn gluten meal if you're interested is a uh, organic uh, byproduct from corn production and uh, it's used as a fertilizer and a pesticide for uh, lawn care. Um, so uh, it takes a couple years of application, but it will tend to work in both those phases. So it's something to consider. Um, no mow grass. We have a couple people in our city that have that. It gets to about six or eight inches tall, and it uh, it's not as durable as the regular turf grass, the bluegrass, but it will still um, tend to uh, function fairly well for you. But if you don't have children, it's probably a better thing. Or pets, if you do have those, stick with the uh, the bluegrass. Uh, and uh, spot spray for weeds is another organic technique. Instead of doing an entire yard, just spray those dandelions or that crabgrass or whatever the case may be instead of doing a, a complete uh, uh, pesticide application. Other things for lawn, organic lawn care, I mentioned aeration earlier and that's a really important thing. And do that in the fall. That tends to be the most uh, productive time to do it. Uh, if you do it in summer, obviously you're going to kill your grass. So make sure you do it 
in the fall uh, when the grass uh, is growing. We have cool season grasses, so their primary growing season is in the fall. That's when they really take off. That's when you think you're a star uh, lawn care person because it always gets really nice and thick and uh, it has nothing to do with our care. It's just the way the, the seeds and the, uh, the genetics are of our particular bluegrass. Uh, or you can do top dressing with uh, compost. Again, um, after you aerate, you can do that and, and then you can seed right into that. Again, in the fall, that's the best time to do the seeding. Uh, we offer a, a compost at a site that I'm going to show in a little bit on a map with uh, free wood chips. It's free for, for the taking. Um, yeah, by uh, on Sea Lake Road and Colorado Avenue is where, where it's located. Yep. Uh, seeding is a good way to do it. Again, do it between August 15th and now with climate change, you can probably push it till the end of September now pretty um, religiously and uh, get by with it. The reason you don't want to go much further than that is the, tr the seed will germinate and then it will get cold and the, the, the roots will end up freezing and killing it. So you want to make sure it gets to past the point of uh, the initial germination so the uh, seed will actually take and you'll be much more successful. This way you don't have to compete with annual weeds either in the fall. If you, if you seed in the spring, you're going to get some growth of grass, but you're going to have a lot more uh, competition from the annual weeds. They will thrive in the springtime. In the fall, they tend to die off, and it's not much of an issue. Um, sodding is uh, something to consider as well if you want a quick green up, uh, if you're having a graduation party or something like that. I just recommend that you put a, a starter fertilizer down. After you disturb the soil, put some starter fertilizer down, then we'll lay your sod down and be sure you stake it in because a lot of sod has some grubs in it that will be peeled back by raccoons. You may come out the next day and find that raccoons have peeled up your turf. Uh, they're looking for those little grubs that are found in that sod. Sod, again, is never going to be any better than the time you buy it. It's only going to get worse It's because it's so richly um, uh, taken care of, uh, fertilized and watered so well at the nurseries and the sod farms that by the time you get it to your house, you're never going to compete with that uh, amount of luxury that the sod has experienced. So uh, it's only going to get worse as time goes on. Keep that in mind. Again, the traditional approach uh, is uh, there's a high maintenance aspect where you can get it treated, fertilized, uh, pesticide and all that many times a year. The Chemlons of the world, I'm not bad mouthing anybody, but companies like that will oversell you on it. You don't have to do nearly the treatments that they recommend. Once or twice in the fall for fertilizing and chemical control is plenty. Um, Fertilizing, uh, again, if you do use a fertilizer, it has to have the zero in the middle. That's the phosphorus, and most fertilizers now, except for the starter fertilizers, have that. That's a state law for 10 or 15 years ago uh, that uh, mandated that the phosphorus be taken out of fertilizer due to the greening up of the lakes. The phosphorus would run off from lawns in the street into the nearby wetlands and ponds, and that's the thing that produces the root growth and the, the uh, shoot growth on uh, plants. So that's why they eliminated that. Um, again, if you do your fertilizing, be sure you do it in a couple directions. Uh, a lot of times, I think we've all seen when uh, you have the striping, the dark and light striping, that's because somebody didn't do the two, two different angles. They just did it one way and uh, obviously thought they were getting everything and they didn't with the fertilizer. So they got a, a zebra or a striped uh, condition. And again, uh, it's a lot of work doing that traditional lawn care. That's another reason why I uh, am a proponent of more of the organic uh, lawn and sustainable landscaping. So um, now this is a basically uh, less inputs is what this is, less water, less nutrients, finding the right plant for the right spot. So you don't have to worry about going out and watering it constantly and uh, making sure that the, uh, the sun is hitting the right spot. So finding that right spot, the right plant for that right spot, and then uh, uh, oftentimes they, they tend to be native plants as well. And native versus uh, non-native, I get that question a lot. And native, uh, for whatever reason, back in uh, 1850, they determined that that was the, uh, the moment in, uh, I think they did a, a, a large uh, native uh, natural uh, geographical inventory of the state here in that time. And they thought whatever was at that point, they determined that was going to be native species, be it uh, plants or animals or uh, aquatic things. Uh, from then on, if you bring anything in, it's a, it's a non-native, but uh, there are a lot of great non-natives as well. We have all kinds of cultivars, which are... Uh, clones of different uh, uh, species of plants, for example, that they find one condition that they really like, that certain orange color on a tr tree in the fall, they will try to reproduce that over and over and over again into a cultivar or a clone. So there's uh, uses for both natives and non-natives. You just have to uh, make sure you get that right plant in that right spot. Uh, I am a proponent of, of natural and more native plants, like I said earlier. Again, it's because of the ecosystem. When you look at the whole ecosystem, 
uh, the plants that, that, if, that are native to our area will tend to have a lot more uh, microorganisms, a lot more animals, a lot more insects, all kinds of uh, related uh, relationships for that plant versus one that's not a non-native. They may have a couple of uh, insects or microorganisms or bacteria or birds, for example, that may like it. So you plant uh, native stuff and you're going to have much more wildlife and uh, be uh, much more holistic for our environment. And here's another good reason. When you look at uh, the native plants, they get a lot more root growth. They get really deep. These tend to be the prairie plants and uh, the, the grasses and the forbs, the flowers. Turf grass goes about six inches down below the turf. These can go way down. So that's why they use a lot of these for rain gardens, for example. The water can come in and trickle down and follow the roots down so you don't have flooding. Uh, also, in dry, area, dry periods, these roots are so deep they can always seem to find moisture where the other ones will dry out right away with the sun if you had the typical turf grass. So something to consider. It takes a little longer for those to grow. They put a lot of production to root growth the first year or two. And then after that, they will uh, tend their, shoot their tops up quite fast. Rain gardens, if you're interested, this is a great website, uh, the bluethumb.org. Uh, Metro Blooms is also a, a proponent of rain gardens, and they're actually sponsoring a rain garden workshop in St. Louis Park this year on the 25th of April at our rec center. And I think it's $10 to participate, and they have a three-hour uh, program where they will start from cradle to grave on, on helping you design and, and the reasons why you should do it and where you should put it and so forth. So again, rain gardens are basically little swales or little indentations in your yard where perhaps the water is, is collecting. You want to, uh, and you just never seem to get turf grass growing there because it's always getting flooded. Uh, this may be a spot where you consider doing it. And you don't have to do a lot of engineering or construction. It could be as simple as uh, just uh, putting some plants in that spot, putting some uh, wood mulch uh, on the plant roots and uh, letting them go at that point. Again, it's the right plant in the right spot. And I just uh, showed, uh, brought some examples up here to show you that uh, there are different types and different strategies for planting any kind of garden. So from tall to short, uh, forbs or flowers versus uh, grasses. And you want to have a combination of them. And again, with perennials, they will start spreading pretty fast. So you do have to do some uh, maintenance with them, but not as much as you would think. Um, butterfly gardens are really popular. And they're a little different from rain gardens because you're trying to get the right food product for the butterfly. And, um, uh, monarchs are in a great need. They just did a study. The monarch population is half of what it was last year. Uh, and the monarch uh, corridor for migration is right here. This is where they come back to lay their eggs and, and reproduce. And then they go down and, and fly down in Mexico. Uh, so they come back then every year. So it's a, uh, but you need the milkweed for that. Um, that's just one idea about how you can uh, just and with just one particular butterfly as well. There's all kinds of butterflies and moths that we have. And if you plant these plants and trees, um, you're going to have a variety of them visiting your uh, site as well. So again, these things are available uh, on our website, all this, this whole presentation, uh, as well as uh, by calling me up or emailing me, you can get pieces of it. It's pretty large. I can't email the entire thing out, but I can certainly give you some information uh, on selected issues if you're interested. Um, I do a lot of gardening at my house. I try to eliminate the turf and I keep building more and more gardens and have less and less turf. I prefer not to mow my yard versus uh, enjoying uh, the flowers and the plants in it. So I have uh, pr proposed an easy way to create an organic garden and it's just a couple of simple steps. You first want to make sure you look at your sunlight and your shade through a 24-hour period during the summertime to make sure that you know where it's shady for half the day or part of the day or if it's all sun. Uh, and wherever that area is that you want to focus that garden on, make sure you study that area for the shade and sun tolerance and the aspects of that. And then once you do that, you can uh, um, obviously design your garden based on that. And a lot of times the shade and sun will kind of dictate how big the garden is and how wide you want to go or how far you want to go. Again, don't take on your whole yard or the backyard or the front yard. That's far too much. Do it in phases. You may be able to create a few gardens on paper, have it in mind, but don't try to implement them all at once. You'll never finish. So. Uh, keep that in mind. So do that. Find out uh, where it is. Uh, draw it. Design it as much as you can. Any kind of shape. You can kind of pace it off in your house and then uh, research some plants. And a great place for that is the Minnesota Department of, of Transportation, the Plant Selector. If you Google that, MnDOT Plant Selector, you'll come up with, to their site. And they, again, have native plants on there from uh, grasses all the way up to trees and everything in between. And they will describe what they are, how they, how they grow, their growing conditions, 
their needs, all kinds of things. So you can use that, and then uh, you can perhaps go to Bachman's or something like that and see it uh, live and get an idea what it actually will look like uh, in person as well. Once you do that, what I do is I'll draw a little with draw that design that I put on paper, uh, spray paint with white paint on the uh, ground. Again, white paint is the neutral color. If you have to uh, dig anything in your yard, uh, you have to use white paint if you're going to mark anything. That's for our gopher one. Those are the people who come in and mark all the utilities. That's the neutral one that, they, that none of the utilities use. They all have their own colors except white. So I recommend using white to draw your, your garden plot, your garden design. And then once you do that, you can certainly bring in all kinds of wood mulch. And again, we have free wood mulch at our site located on Colorado and Cedar Lake Road. Or you can buy bags at Home Depot, but we'd prefer to use our own native stuff. I think it's better. Put it in about six inches thick all the way through that whole design. Um, oh, I'm sorry, back up. Put the newspaper down. That's the next thing. Ten, ten sheets of newspaper really works well. If you use a few less, you can probably get by with it. Put that right on your grass. You don't have to do any digging that way. It also creates a nice uh, uh, elevation change and a nice topography for your grass or your, for your lawn by having different uh, heights of uh, garden instead of having it all at the same height. So do that. Put the ten paper pieces of newspaper down, you may have to put a few rocks down to hold it in place, particularly if it's windy, you may not do it on a windy day. Put the uh, wood mulch on top of that, and then after that point, you'll have your plants hopefully purchased. If not, go out and buy those ones that you figured out from the plant selector. Put them in the different spots where you think they may work. Set back a little bit, and then after that, start digging away, and what I'd recommend is doing one, dig right through the newspaper, uh, have another pot or something there so you can put the excess dirt into that so it's not contaminating your wood mulch. And then uh, once you dig it in, uh, cover it up with uh, some dirt, a little bit of dirt, put the wood mulch around it, and you're good to go. And, and you will have uh, no weed problem. Uh, what we find with the fabric, the artificial fabric, or the synthetic fabric, the plastic stuff, is that it uh, actually holds out too much moisture. So the moisture will actually beat off. It rains and it runs right off it, and the plants don't get enough moisture. So if you have the uh, newspaper, it absorbs water, and it serves as a nice uh, weed barrier as well. So pretty simple stuff to do, and then you don't have to dig up your yard. If you've ever tried digging up your turf grass, it's a pretty hard uh, project, and it takes a lot of effort. Again, if you're going to be doing any planting, make sure you know where your property lines are. I can't tell you how many times I go out to properties and people have no clue where their property lines are, and they end up putting irrigation systems, uh, planting large trees, or a number of different things on their neighbor's property or on their borderline, the bro property border, excuse me and uh, it only leads to problems down, down the road. Again, you can get a survey plat from the city for a nominal fee and if you don't have one already. And be simple about it. Use odd numbers. I'm not a landscape designer, but that's what the, the few uh, educational opportunities I've had is what they pro propose is uh, using the odd numbers. So you're you're going to be much easier. Keep it simple. Don't get too uh, complicated. You can always add more plants as you uh, go through your gardening. Here is uh, some uh, Great resources for native plants. Uh, Outback Nursery, they really specialize in native trees, but they have a lot of native shrubs as well. And all the others that I have used, we have used in the city, and they all are uh, very reputable and have high quality uh, goods. I want to touch on invasive species a little bit. And you can see from the graph here, uh, behind, behind uh, habitat loss uh, is native species, uh, or I'm sorry, is invasive species that are taking over uh, our native species. So our native species are getting degraded from, from those two things primarily, invasive species and habitat loss. A good example of habitat loss is coyotes. And we never had coyotes here about until like five years ago in St. Louis Park. Uh, but they have been pushed in because they've lost their habitat further out in the metro area. Uh, from all the building, all the, the houses, the roads, the, the industry that's being built there, they have moved in. They found some nice areas within our woods and, uh, and things of that sort, wetlands. So they've made a home here. Uh, they're, they're one of the luckier ones. There's a lot of species that are losing their entire uh, habitats. Native species are the, the thing now that we're all focusing on in my business because those are the things that are really uh, causing a lot of harm in our state and our metro area. You can see it's uh, exponential growth with these, unfortunately, and we are at the top of the exponential growth. And right here is where people like me are trying to manage things. I'm going to touch on a few different types of invasive species. Here's a campaign that the state of Minnesota has started. You can certainly go online and uh, you can go to the playcleanandgo.org and that has all kinds of information on the hot um, invasive species at the moment. Just to bring a point back, dandelions have been around since 1600s. They are an invasive species and uh, we have many others that are, we live with every day. Uh, some we can live with and some we can probably not. 
uh, sea lamprey. They have controlled it a little bit in Lake Superior. Uh, it was decimating the, the brown trout quite a bit, but they did uh, disrupt the life cycle. They did some research on it, found where it natively uh, came from, and found out there was a weak point in its life cycle that they could control with chemicals. So that is controlled zebra mussel. You're going to hear a lot more about that, unfortunately, as well as the big head and silver carp. Um, this is a problem. Thank goodness we don't live where it's warmer. Uh, this is the Burmese python. is an issue in Florida and uh, it is uh, disrupting the alligator habitat. So it's competing with the alligators for the same habitat. It's become a real problem. This is a deadly invasive. We don't have those here, but just wanted to point out that uh, the warmer climates have more issues. And again, with invasive species, we're giving them off to other countries in the world as much as we're getting them in here in America and in Minnesota. So it goes, it's a two-way street. It goes both ways. I'm going to touch on a few of these uh, on, in this presentation. The emerald ash borer is a big thing. It was just found uh, recently over in Lakewood Cemetery, which isn't very far from St. Louis Park. Um, it's not here yet, but I'm predicting probably by 2015 we will have it. The problem with this is that it sits and it's in a small population for a while on a tree or a couple of trees, and then they'll keep reproducing, and then the population starts to really swell, and all at once you will see a bunch of trees that are infected with it. It's really hard to, to, to find these trees. It's a real science and very uh, insidious, this insect, it hides quite well. Um, Minnesota has a huge black ash population. There's three different ash. Uh, black ash is our native that tends to grow more of the swampy wetlands. Uh, we have over uh, almost 900 million ash, uh, primarily black ash. So our timber industry is concerned about emerald ash borer as well. Here are the three that are found in the state. Uh, we plant mostly green ash uh, in the metro. We have it now in St. Louis Park for Oh, I bet five to eight years we quit planting at green ash and any ash because of the emerald ash borer. It, it came in uh, from Asia in crating, in wood crating. Most of the crating is supposed to be treated with pesticides. Uh, this obviously wasn't. It was, uh, uh, the product was taken out in the Detroit Harbor. The crate was set aside, and then these things hatched out of the wood crating and went to the nearby uh, ash trees and started feeding and breeding and reproducing uh, in those trees. And then before you know it, uh, the, if you see here, the red and the yellow are where they've confirmed emerald ash borer so far in the United States. Uh, and it has spread pro primarily by us. We're our own worst enemy when it comes to uh, things like this. Uh, a lot of people see a nice dead tree, dead ash tree standing there. They think, oh, I'm going to cut it up, give it to my neighbor, bring some up to my lake, lake cabin maybe burn some in my own firewood or my own fireplace at home. But by the time they uh, get it all situated and move it, move the uh, emerald ash borers in there, it hatches out and then it will start uh, feeding and breeding again uh, and reproducing on nearby trees wherever that stuff was brought to. So a lot of these uh, areas, if you see the yellow and the red, is correlated with the freeways or state parks where people have brought firewood in. So firewood is the biggest culprit for spreading emerald ash borer. It can only fly up to two miles on its own. Here is a map of uh, where it is located now. It is in the Twin Cities. I said that earlier. It's Midway is the primary. That was the epicenter. That's where they first found it. Again, they think it came from some crating that came from China uh, in a uh, factory in St. Paul. And then it has spread successively. Uh, the last couple findings have been in Fort Snelling. And then this is the one that's closest to St. Louis Park at uh, Lakewood Cemetery. And there are a number of trees there. Uh, that have been uh, identified and removed at this point for it. And this is the traps you see around. They put, put these in St. Louis Park. We typically get about 10 of those. Uh, they're triangular in shape, about a foot and a half long. They have a chemical in there, a pheromone, which is a synthetic uh, attractant that the female emerald ash borer, uh, it's, a, it's based on the female, on the pheromone, the, the ash, excuse me, the female ash, emerald ash borer has that it attracts the male. They synthesize that, and they have put it in a sticky substance, put it around the insides of those, uh, that uh, uh, trap. And so the, fem the male comes in there thinking there's a female uh, emerald ash borer in there, and it gets stuck in there. And so they can count how many they find around, and that's how they know if the population is a, an issue or not. And here's the life cycle of it. I'm just going to show you a little bit here. It, uh, what happens is that they'll lay the eggs uh, underneath the bark. They have what's called an ovipositor. It's a long little needle attached to their body, the female will lay the egg under the bark, and then it will hatch into the larva or the worm. And then it starts, usually goes south. It starts at north and goes south. And as it eats the uh, underneath, it eats the wood a little bit right underneath the bark. And that's where the veins of the tree are, where all the conduction is of the water and the minerals and the nutrients. So it disrupts that conduction 
and the tree cannot uh, get any water and uh, nutrients and it ends up dying. So you get thousands and thousands on one tree and you can see the problem. It gets to this point that it will metamorphosize into that beetle uh, that's the green beetle that is synonymous with, that is the emerald ash borer that people think of, not the larva. They always think of the beetle. It makes these uh, D-shaped holes. That's one thing we look for in, for infestation uh, is that to see if there are signs of emerald ash borer. We also look for woodpeckers. That's a good sign too because somehow woodpeckers innately know when the emerald ash borer gets to a certain size right before it's going to change into that um, beetle they will end up finding it and picking it out. So what we look for is this is bark that's been kind of stripped from the uh, woodpecker and then there are holes along here where if we were to strip this bark back you'd see that serpentine pattern going north and south down here and then uh, right here would be the end of that serpentine pattern. So we look for a lot of the woodpecker holes. We have native wood borers that are, affect ash too so it, it's uh, like I said it's rather insidious. It's pretty hard to tell the native from the EAB. Um, there are, you don't have to lose hope if you have an ash tree. There are some things you can do. There's a basal drench, they call it, where you put it around the base of the tree. You can buy it at Home Depot or hardware stores like Menards as well. Uh, it's only good if you do it by yourself uh, without a professional up to about 15 inches. Anything bigger than that, 15 inches diameter of your tree. Any tree bigger than 15 inches diameter, you should use a professional because they have to uh, use a different chemical and it has to be uh, calibrated for a certain size, of whatever size your tree is. So. That's one way to do it. Uh, the chemical gets into the ground, it gets absorbed into the, the roots of the tree, and then the tree will suck it up. And that's a systemic, um, but what this is is an insecticide. And the other one is I'm going to talk about is an insecticide as well. So it kills the insect. It gets all the way through the tree and any parts of the tree system-wide, and then it will, uh, if the, if the um, insect comes in there to feed on it or breed on it or lays its eggs, those will all get killed by the insecticide. The other way is injecting it, and there's a couple different methods. There's one that you have to do it every year, or there's one that you do it every two years. Uh, obviously, it's the, the two-year one is a little bit more expensive, but by injecting it less, you're causing less harm to the tree. So something to consider is probably a little bit more envir environmentally friendly to use the injections as well. I'm not recommending anyone to necessarily inject yet. Perhaps when it's actually in St. Louis Park is when... And we'll let you know. We'll certainly put it on our website. We'll put it in the Sun Sailor. We'll make sure a lot of people know Facebook, all the social media. We'll, we will certainly let, let people know when Emerald Ash Borer comes to St. Louis Park. Uh, but up until that point, by pre-treating your tree, you're probably just wasting money. So again, your tree could even have Emerald Ash Borer. could have it up to about 40% of your canopies being destroyed or gone from the Emerald Ash Borer. You could still inject it into the tree, and this insecticide will kill it at that point. So the idea is to time it if you do have it so it doesn't harm uh, the physiology of the tree too much so the tree can continue to grow. And we get a lot of calls on uh, various insects. People think they've found it. Uh, they haven't. The cicada at the far end, you can see that's the thing that bu does the buzzing in the late summer. That's probably the largest, uh, one of the larger insects that we have around that fly. Uh, so compared to the emerald ash borer, um, it's, it's quite large. We do a lot of planting, and if you have ash, I'm recommending that you start planting or thinking about planting other trees. You can certainly inject them for a while. The city's going to take some trees out. We have removed a bunch already that have been under power lines that have been chopped off uh, on one half due to power lines or something of that sort, or we've removed about 300 trees now that were really kind of stressed out, not doing very well. Uh, and then we're also uh, planting a lot of trees and trying to diversify what we plant. So. Again, uh, we're going to do some injections too on some larger the ash that are in some uh, significant spots for us. Uh, so we're doing a combination of things with the hope that we're going to uh, uh, delay the cost. So if we don't do anything, uh, what's going to happen? The emerald ash borer will come in and it's going to wipe out all the trees at once. And we have done an inventory. We have about 3,000 elm trees in our public properties. That's our boulevards and our parks. And I'm estimating we have at least that, if not more, on our private properties. So when emerald ash borer comes, we want to make, make sure people are injecting, replanting, doing a variety of things to make sure that we don't get hit all at once and all the trees will uh, die. So, you mean ash trees? Uh, you said elm trees. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I meant ash. Yeah, ash. Yep. Yeah, he, 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 the gentleman clarified uh, it was... Uh, I meant el ash, excuse me, versus elm. This is elm here. This is what um, our mistake was in the past. We planted the same species all around, which is called a monoculture. And we learned our lesson, I did at least, from Dutch elm disease. So we didn't plant as many ash trees 
uh, which a lot of other cities uh, are in a terrible state. They have 50 or 60 percent of their canopy in ash tree because they didn't learn the lesson. They went back and planted ash because it grew so well and so easy like the initial American elm did. So what we do is we try to diversify with, within blocks. If you go to Minneapolis, you'll notice they plant the same species for one block or two blocks perhaps, and then they'll try to diversify that way. They are starting to switch now where they're getting more diversified within the block uh, as well. But we have a list of recommended species that we'd be happy to uh, send to you. It's available on our web as well. And these are species that are tried and true, uh, that grow well. Uh, most of them are native. Uh, not all of them, but they're different sizes as well. So if you have a, a tight area, there's some short statured, some big shade trees, a lot of conifers as well. Uh, gypsy moth is a, an insect that's uh, invasive as well. It's not, it was here in, in St. Louis Park right on the edge in the northeast corner. Uh, actually, it was found in Gold Valley about 10 years ago, but they did a, uh, a mile coverage because this thing can fly up to a mile of, um, of control. And what they do to control it is they'll fly at treetop level, and the trees are out just in bloom in May, and then uh, with a helicopter, and they'll drop this uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, BT, it's a, a bacteria that will actually get inside the, um, the caterpillar of the gypsy moth and ends up killing it that way. So. Um, but the problem is that it will kill the desirable stuff as well. We have a lot of native uh, butterflies and moths that are in that family with the gypsy moth that ends up killing those as well. So we'd rather avoid that. So we're trying to educate folks about it. And you can see it spread from the east coast again, like a lot of our invasives have spread from east to west. Uh, this has gone all the way up through basically Wisconsin now, and it's right at our border in Minnesota. Here's a good map. Uh, again, they've done uh, those traps. This is the trap they use versus the purple one for emerald ash borer. That's the gypsy moth. Again, it's got that sticky pheromone in there. The red is where it's high density, where they found with the, using those traps, they found that the high density of gypsy moth, and you can see it correlates with our North Shore and our, uh, our bluff country. And it gets its name because it lays its eggs on wheel wells and rims of RVs or cars or trailers, and people that are saturated with it already from the East Coast will drive to our nice, to the areas that they want to uh, camp in or uh, tourist in, and uh, they end up hatching then the eggs, and then they will start uh, spreading from there. And the problem with gypsy moth is that they will feed on any kind of a leaf. So they're not too picky, and they will keep feeding and feeding and feeding until there's not a leaf left on a tree. So if you keep doing that uh, year after year, say you have a mature uh, oak tree, you do that for two or three years, combined with the droughts that we've had over the last 10 years, these trees will end up dying. So the East Coast has seen acres and acres of dead trees due to gypsy moths. So that's uh, the problem with that. This is a, a thing we've been seeing lately again. It's from Japan. Um, and it is more of a nuisance. It can cause some damage. It likes linden trees. It likes um, uh, grape tr grapes, uh, likes roses, those are the, th the three pref preferred things, but they will eat anything. And what we recommend is to uh, try to, if you know you have it, uh, and you've seen your grass that looks like this, that means you probably have it that they're laying their eggs in your grass. A lot of times they like the well-fertilized grass, the, or the well, and well-moist grass. So if you have an irrigation system and fertilized golf courses, for example, are experiencing a lot of problems with it. It's a lot easier for the gypsy moth to lay or the gypsy moth, I'm sorry, the Japanese beetle to lay its eggs in, in uh, well-fertilized, moist turf than it is. And they're more successful that way, too, for the larva versus uh, uh, hard, deadpan um, type of a turf. The, uh, the larva will actually feed on the grass roots, and, and that's why they end up killing it. So then they get to a certain stage. Usually it's in right around July in Minnesota where they will actually hatch and become the, the beetle that's the nuisance on our trees and, and shrubs and other plants. Again, they do this uh, nice little lacing of the leaves, and that's how you can tell. A lot of times you'll see a brown tree in the middle of the summer, and that's actually uh, from the Japanese beetle. Again, it's not as bad as some of the other invasives I've talked about or, or will here, but uh, it's still a nuisance. Dutch elm disease is a fungus that's a, an invasive species. It's been around since the 1900s. And we still have it in uh, St. Louis Park. And what happens is that the fungus is transferred by a vector, which is the elm bark beetle, uh, right here. And there's two of them. This is the uh, native, and this is the European one. Both of them are vectors. They uh, will feed on the small crotches of the, the new growth of an elm tree, which is, tends to be on the outer edges. They'll eat a little hole in there, and they rub off that spore that's on their body. The spore gets in there, the Dutch elm disease fungus spore, gets into that hole, and it gets into the veins of the tree, and the tree 
will end up killing itself trying to stop that fungus from spreading throughout its veins. It produces a gum, but it's a little too late and it ends up um, dying of um, lack of moisture, basically. So uh, we, end up, we end up taking these down to try to control the spread of the beetle. Uh, if we left the trees standing there, the beetles would reproduce in the millions on one tree and have the fungus all over their bodies and then continue that cycle, go and feed on healthy elms and so forth and so on. Here's what they do. They lay their eggs underneath the bark right here. They lay it along here. These are all the little larvae that have hatched and they're very similar to that emerald ash borer. They feed right underneath the bark between the cambium and the bark and then they get to a certain point to metamorphosize into a beetle and then they fly out. And again, they can go up to a couple miles. Here are our numbers that we've had for Dutch elm disease removal in the past, oh, I don't know, 20 years here. And uh, they are, you can see we remove a lot of trees. The average size is a couple of feet in diameter. So it's a lot of biomass, a lot of benefits that we're losing from all those trees that we removed. Oak wilt, we don't really have a problem in St. Louis Park. We don't have a lot of oaks. The ones we do tend to be bur oaks. Uh, it's the white oak family of the bur oak or white oak. They still can get oak wilt, but they don't get it as easily as the red oaks. And the problem is, tends to be in Minnesota and the northern suburbs like Anoka County. They have a lot of uh, red oaks there. And if you have uh, any property with red oaks on it, be sure you call us. Uh, if it's in St. Louis Park, we can go out and do an inspection. And by the way, we do free inspections. Anytime, you can email or call us, and we would be happy to either set up an appointment or just go out and visit your site and look at your, your uh, particular problem, and then we'll give you a call back or email you back with uh, our prescription on how to make it better. Uh, oak wilt is uh, pervasive primarily in the Midwest, and it's very similar to Dutch elm disease. It will uh, cut off the circulation of the tree and it ends up killing the oaks. Buckthorn is uh, another invasive. It's all over. It is considered a noxious plant, but it's not one that we have to control because we can't control it. It's everywhere and it is um, uh, pervasive and it grows like crazy and uh, so we don't have any ordinance against that. People ask me all the time, can, we, can you control it? My neighbor has it. No, we can't. We can't make anybody cut it down because we have it on our own properties we can't even control. The state has it. Everybody has it. It is uh, a real problem. And this was brought in as a hedge plant uh, many years ago. In fact, it was sold in the nurseries up to like 10 years ago as a hedge plant. Now no one can sell it. It's against the law to do that. There's two different types. This is the the, uh, the glossy and the common. The common tends to produce a lot more berries, and those are the ones you see in the fall. Buckthorn will hold on to its leaves all the way through November, so that's one way you can identify it in fall. Look for the only thing that still has leaves on it, and that is buckthorn. It's really labor intensive to remove, so if you have it, you either got to pull it out by its roots, and we do loan these out, these weed wrenches. We have three of these that, if you have it, and it's only an inch or so in diameter, inch or less, by all means use the weed wrench because it'll pull out the entire root. You don't have to worry about it again save your back at the same time. If it's larger than that, you'll have to cut it off and treat it with the chemical. And we recommend putting a little dye. Uh, it's, the chemical is just simply Roundup, it could be. Putting a chemical or a dye in the, in the chemical in the Roundup so you know which stumps you've treated. A lot of times people have multiple stumps and they think they've treated it and they haven't, but the dye is a good way to mark that. Uh, here's some other ones. We've, we, they just found it in Duluth just a few days ago. The, uh, brown marmorated stink bug and the problem with that is, that it, it, is it gets its name uh, honestly I guess it is a, a problem if you crush it it smells really bad and they love to get inside just like box elder bugs or the Asian lady beetle that we saw a few years ago that's another of the same type of thing uh, it's going to affect our agriculture quite a bit too so uh, farmers are concerned about that the spotted wing drosophila is a uh, fruit fly basically and it's a one that's not native here and it's going to affect any fruits that you have. If you have raspberries or strawberries or anything like that, it's going to be a problem with that. And then the Asian longhorn beetle, they have it in Chicago. They've found it in some of the East Coast, uh, New York City. I think it's in Connecticut. Problem with that is it likes maples. We have a lot of maples here and they, they have these huge holes that they create as well. So they uh, are a big problem in some spots. Just a few more. I'm not going to go through those. Just want to mention earthworms are not native. There's not a native earthworm to Minnesota. In fact, there's, I think there's one or two in the whole United States found in the southeastern part of the U.S. The rest have been imported, and they, people always thought they were really good for my turf, and they are because they will aerate it. They will create little tunnels that your grass then can grow into, and the roots of the grass will thrive because of that aeration. They can move. They can get water. But they're not good for our uh, forests. Our forest floors, what happens is that we have oaks, for example, or maples that are growing natively in our forests, 
and they need that duff layer, the layer that where the leaves and the needles have fallen down and create that nice organic mass. Well, the earthworms eat that organic mass down to nothing. So then our trees will, will seed or drop their seed and the seeds can't germinate because they need that organic mass to germinate in. So it is a big problem for our forests. And unfortunately, it's been found almost throughout the entire United States. And I think there's a little patch in the boundary waters where there are no earthworms. So if you get up there and you fish, don't bring any earthworms up there. I just want to mention Lyme's disease is getting larger and larger. If you're out in the woods ever during the uh, early part of the spring, early summer, uh, be sure you cover up, be sure you use DEET. Uh, Lyme's disease is no laughing matter and it's becoming a big problem in Minnesota. Obviously, you can see Wisconsin has a huge problem. Uh, they think it may be related to the high density deer her herds, although they're not the only vector with the actual uh, field mice, is a bigger vector for um, uh, Lyme's disease. And uh, allergies, a lot of people have requested to have male trees only. They don't want fruiting trees, which are the females. So, with the males, you have the pollen, so that's uh, increased the amount of allergens around. Here, planting. We just want to touch on some planting. Again, that plant selector, if you want to go to that for, for uh, finding out more uh, ideas about plants as well, or trees and, and plants, go, go to that site. Be sure you figure out what type of a plant you want. There's all different shapes and sizes, and there's a lot more than this, but make sure you know what size upon maturity you get as well when you buy these things. They look good for a while, but then five or ten years down the road, they overcrowd your house or other plants and become an issue. We're in zone four. Uh, but you can probably buy some things in Zone 5. The, the smaller the number, the colder it is. So Zone 3 is northern Minnesota. Zone 4 is southern Minnesota. Zone 5 is right at the border and so forth and so on. So we can do plant a lot of Zone 5 here, especially if you have it in a protected area. If you're buying trees, and if you have any trees from our tree sale, which is going on now, and we still have a few trees left too. Uh, we're having a partnership again. This is our third or I think our fifth year actually partnering with Tree Trust, selling trees at wholesale cost, $35 a tree. Uh, go out to treetrust.org and you can certainly see what's available. I think there's three species left out of five. Anyway, if you're planting or buying a tree from even a nursery, if it's a Home Depot or whatever, if it comes in a container, make sure you, you find out where the root flare is. And this is the root flare down here. What oftentimes they do in nurseries is that they have rows of trees and they have machines that come through and will clear the rows in between the trees and any plant for that matter of the weeds and but when they do that they push them to push the dirt to the side and they keep doing that after a few years especially with trees when they're growing for three to five years in a nursery more and more dirt gets built up onto that root of the tree and what they have found is if you don't remove the dirt down to here it ends up causing a lot of problems and it's called stem girdling roots what happens is the roots will just encircle themselves for some reason over and over again and then it, as the tree grows and the roots grow they constrict upon themselves and will cut off the circulation of the tree. It ends up killing the tree. So, uh, like this case, this is a keeps growing probably a few more years. The top of the tree will end up dying and ends up killing itself. We find this a lot with maples. Any kind of a maple, sugar, Norway, um, the uh, the relatively new Freeman or Autumn Blaze maple. They do that quite well. Lindens will do that too. But most species will end up doing that too. If you don't make sure how deep you you plant it. So, again. Dig down. If you get a container, you have to dig down uh, all the way down until you find that first order root wherever it is. A lot of times you may have inches of soil. It seems like it's the wrong thing to do, but it is the right thing to do. Keep digging it down until you find those roots. Um, and also with the, uh, the containers, you want to cut down along an inch all the way around the whole ball here. They have found that if a, a lot of these things have been in containers too long, especially if you get those deals in the fall, those fall sales, the uh, trees or the plants have been in the containers too long and the roots encircle the container. Well, if you cut an inch off all the way around and then you cut it down until you find those first order roots, you're really coming up, the, the size of the ball you have is quite small. It's about half of what you probably think it should be, but that's the, the right thing to do and that's the way you'll get actually better root growth by cutting it off. If you don't cut these off around the side, the roots again will just keep encircling and you won't have very good uh, growth. We use a lot of these. You see these white things. We have white ones on new trees that we plant. That's for protecting against deer, uh, rabbits, and also it helps uh, 
protect a certain species from uh, what's called sun scald, uh, a reflection of snow onto the bark. The thinner bark trees like maples will end up getting that. If they don't have a protection on it, the snow reflects off it, it ends up heating up the sap under the bark and it ends up cracking it after it, it cools down again at night. So we use those things for all those reasons. So that's why you see these white things on there. We always ask people to leave them on. It looks a little tough, but they're biodegradable and the tree, they do expand as the tree grows. They will not constrict or hurt the tree. And here, mulching is important. Don't do the volcano at the top. That's what we call it. It looks like a volcano. You create too much of a, a moist and a great habitat for insects and fungus with that volcano. So make sure you get all the wood chips away from the, the base of the tree. Nice and dry there and then create a little concave uh, with a nice lip around about, uh, oh, I don't know, the width of the, uh, the canopy of the tree. Make your, your uh, wood, wood uh, uh, rim the same, same, same width as that. I mentioned where our site was for our wood mulch and compost. It's available 24-7. We have it all the time, particularly from April through, well, November, the growing season primarily. A couple of things to consider for your yard. Um, again, uh, don't plant this year, especially before May 15th. I don't think we probably will even get snow, hopefully. Uh, it may not be gone before then even, but no. Hopefully it'll be gone in about a month, but Again, don't plant before that. We have tried that and you just get burned because you'll have a frost come in and kill all your plants. So plant after May 15th, uh, get some more mulch, get some compost from us, uh, get, get prepped early in the, the spring. You can certainly divide a lot of perennials as well, even if they flower spring or fall. If you do the, uh, the fall ones that flower in the fall and you, you divide them in the spring, you may not have much flower uh, after, upon division that growing season, but uh, the other ones, the ones that will flower in the spring, you, you uh, divide them in the spring, uh, you should have some better flower for that season. And certain trees you don't want to prune because of those diseases that I talked about and for other things. And uh, also some reasons to prune. Um, we do it primarily for safety, for the branches hanging low over streets, over sidewalks, those kinds of things, storm damage. But uh, there's a variety of things if it's hanging over your neighbor's property. There's all kinds of legal issues with that. Your neighbor can cut up to the property line legally. Um, so keep that in mind if you have a tree and they ask you to do that. They certainly can if uh, you're not willing to do that. Uh, evergreens and uh, flowering trees, if they flower in the springtime, like a lilac, for example, or a linden, you want to prune it right after it's done flowering because the flowers are in the new growth. So if you prune it in the fall, that you're going to prune off that new growth for the following season. They will not have flowers, so keep that in mind. Spring flowering, prune right after they, the flowers die. Anything else you can prune uh, later, particularly we recommend uh, in the dormant season if it does flower in the fall. The evergreens, they have that new growth typically in late June, early July. It's that lighter green growth. If you want to have your arborvitae, for example, a globe, if it's a round one, you want to keep it that same size, prune it when it's that light green and you'll uh, keep it that size uh, in perpetuity if you do it every year. Here's some things not to do if you hire somebody that does any of these things. Uh, we'd like to know about it because we will not uh, uh, tolerate this kind of uh, poor uh, workmanship uh, in St. Louis Park. These are all things that really hurt trees and end up killing them, and uh, you're wasting your money if you hire people that do that. So if you're pruning things on your own, you want to do the three-step method where you want to reduce the stress of the weight. So make a little incision here. That will kind of reduce the stress for the weight for back to here. Make a cut here a few inches out. And then make that final one here. Do not cut this part off. That's the uh, root collar that they have found that that's, uh, if you leave that, it may be a little stub, but it will uh, facilitate the healing. So then you, you should, after a year, if it's a small tree, you'll have a full donut. That means you did the correct prune. After a couple years, you won't even know that that was a branch at that point. And we recommend using a licensed contractor. We have a list of licensed contractors available online. We can send it to you as well. They are, have a certified arborist, which is a person that has to take some tests to attain a little higher uh, professionalism. Uh, they have to have one on staff, and then they also have to prove uh, insurance. So you don't want the, somebody that has that great deal knocking on doors from a storm damage saying, I can give you a great deal, I'm down at the neighbors. Don't use them because they tend to not have insurance. And if they drop something on your house or one of their people got hurt on your property, your, your insurance potentially would have to cover that. So we cover their workers' comp, we make sure they have that, their ins liability insurance, as well as their certification for uh, professionalism. One of the last things is uh, pruning. You know, a lot of people have hedges and they prune them the wrong way. They flat top them and flat side them. Well, if you do that, 
the sun's not going to be able to hit it at certain angles. So you really have to round the top or angle it and angle out the sides too so then the sun can find it in all times of the, of the day and then you'll have a thick shrub. Otherwise you're going to have pockets where the sun will not hit it and before you know it other things will come in like Siberian elm or buckthorn will replace your desirable uh, hedge and uh, cause a problem. Renewal pruning, a lot of those can be done for the, uh, the bigger, um, older shrubs in particular, like lilac. If you have really thick stems where it's really leggy, meaning it's all wood, and then you have the green up on top, you can cut a third of those larger ones down. And I recommend cutting them at different lengths. Cut some all the way down, some knee length, some higher, because they will sprout wherever you cut them. So do that, and then you can create a nice full hedge again all the way up, or full shrub all the way up from ground to the top instead of just having it all at the top. So it's something to consider. And with that sign, that's uh, the end of it. I just have a few events I wanted to, to highlight. I mentioned the Rain Garden Workshop. We do have a, an Earth Day and Arbor Day. We have a, a creek cleanup. It's all about the environment here. Um, we have a tree sale that's going on. I think, like I said, we have like 13 or 14 total trees left. I think three different species. And then our Parktacular, where there's all kinds of fun things for the kids. And we have an eco fair where we try to highlight some environmental things. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Mm -hmm.